Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in our seventh session of uh, Center for, and for Strategic and Global Studies lecture series. Uh, this is uh, brought to you by or uh, organized by the Chakra Study Global Strategy Strategies or Center for Strategic and Global Studies, Department of International Relations, Universitas Erlangga, Surabaya. And this is a place where we can discuss a, a lot of uh, important issues. I think uh, several weeks ago we discussed about China. Uh, we also discussed uh, Black Lives Matter in Russia. We discussed uh, Chinese hegemonic affinity in the region in Southeast Asia. And today we will discuss, we will actually return to our initial uh, issues when we start launching this, this lecture series. We discuss a lot about uh, COVID-19 and it's uh, impact on a lot of things, on European Union, uh, ASEAN, uh, regional integration. And today we will talk about something which is quite interesting because of course I don't know much about the region, but we have two experts uh, on East Asia. So today we will talk about um, COVID-19, living under COVID-19 and its uh, actual impact on daily life of people in Japan and South Korea. Uh, we have this uh, distinguished speaker today, my good friend, uh, my mentor during the Hokkaido uh, summer school, the border study summer school, um, assistant professor Naomi Chi from Hokkaido University. Uh, Naomi, hi Naomi. You, Hello. Hi. Okay, so uh, Naomi is uh, graduated from the University of British Columbia uh, and oh, with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. But then she went to Hokkaido University for her MA and PhD. She's currently an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Public Policy. And she works a lot on uh, Migration, demographic changes, uh, multiculturalism, gender and ethnic and sexual minorities. Um, I remember her talk several years ago back in Sapporo, I think, uh, regarding the migrant workers. And also I remember uh, listening to her presentation two years ago. It's, it's already two years in, in Brisbane, I think. <laughs> uh, in Brisbane, yeah, uh, it's a conference in, in Brisbane, and, and we met several times uh, after that. And Naomi also joined us uh, as a keynote speaker in our uh, Erlanga conference on IR uh, also two years ago. Now, uh, today we she will talk about the I will I will call it the, the impact of COVID 19 in the daily life of people, and not only ordinary people, but uh, most vulnerable people in, in Japanese or in South Korean society and youth. Um, migrant workers and also minorities. Uh, so Naomi, the, the, the time and, uh, is yours and you can start sharing your presentation with all of Great. us. Great. Radio, terima kasih. Is that right? Terima kasih. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, so, that's good. Salam. Uh, <laughs> Senang bertemu anda. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's that's uh, the only phrase that I can speak in Indonesian. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, hopefully, if you invite me back next year, I'll be a little bit more fluent. But thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful series, and it's really great to see you, Radito. And many of you um, that uh, that are here today, I met you at Arlanga. Um, it was really really wonderful to see you then. And although I can't see you, uh, we can't see each other in person. Um, we still have. Uh, technology, which enables us to at least meet um, and talk about really important issues. So uh, in that sense, I thank um, Zoom. <laughs> and, and, and also, of course, I, I thank uh, uh, the organizers um, for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, what's going on here in Japan um, and uh, what's going on in Korea. And I'm really, really um, happy to uh, uh, meet Anissa uh, virtually, even though it's virtually, um, who is an uh, expert on Korea. And uh, she's uh, currently in Seoul. So I think she'll be able to provide us with um, sort of real live data that uh, um, that she um, uh, 
encounters every day in, in Seoul. So um, without any further ado, I'll uh, like to start my presentation. I did prepare a PowerPoint slide um, presentation. So uh, let me put it up um, and share with you. Uh, and uh, if you um, if there are you know, sort of uh, requests uh, for the PowerPoint, um, I would be happy to share them. Uh, so please let me know um, and I can send it to Radicio and, and you can um, share it with, with uh, the people that are here today. Um, so the running title, uh, I'm sorry, Radicio, I had to change it like a couple of times. So I did end up um, with living under COVID-19 in East Asia. I will mainly talk about social and political challenges uh, in Japan and Korea, um, what's sort of kind of been revealed uh, under the COVID-19. So um, let me let me start. So uh, today I checked um, the Johns Hopkins, the uh, research center, the dashboard. Um, that's that's I think that's what most people um, uh, check to see um, when the, when they are uh, looking for the uh, data for um, the coronavirus. So globally, as as of today, 13.6 million people are infected. Um, 586,000 uh, are uh, deaths globally. In Japan, um, there are 23,000, uh, about 500 infected, 985 deaths, uh, which is, you know, uh, relatively small um, for a country that's um, quite heavily populated. In Korea, uh, 13,000 infected, 291 deaths, again, also on a quite low. And just to sort of, you know, uh, to compare and contrast, uh, Taiwan, I won't be talking too much about Taiwan today, today but um, Taiwan, 451 infected, seven deaths. Of course, one of the most successful countries that have contained COVID-19 um, in East Asia. Uh, so um, the first few slides, I'll like, uh, I will talk about sort of um, the measures uh, taken by the Japanese government and the Korean government, respectively, against COVID-19. So as you know, um, this is a mystery uh, to, to us, even in Japan. Uh, but Japan uh, did not have a lockdown, and um, which is which is quite interesting because uh, even though they didn't have a full on lockdown, they, Japan was able to keep it down, or th they are keeping it down to about you know um, twenty three thousand infected. Now, um, of course, the last few days, almost last three four days, Tokyo has been experiencing a second wave. We'll we'll, ha we'll have to see how this pans out. But up until uh, last week, um, the numbers were only, you know, we, we were able to have um, limit the numbers of infected uh, down to 23,000, uh, again, in a, in a quite heavily populated country. Uh, and one of the, so a lot of people have different opinions as to why it's working in Japan. But one of the things that people uh, mention in common is that uh, Japan's sort of um, social distance, distancing is working. So in Japanese, we, we say the sammitsu, in English, so the the the, the, um, the translation is three C's. So it's avoiding closed spaces, crowded places, and closed contact settings. Now, um, this is working because a lot of people. I mean, as I said, relatively working because a lot of the restaurants, um, a lot of the um, like theaters and places um, where, of course, you know, you you would uh, usually see a lot of people, like a crowded place. Uh, they have taken extra measures to make sure that the seats are far apart and so on and so forth. And, you know, sort of uh, constantly um, uh, sort of um, changing, uh, opening the windows and, 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 and filtering the, and the air and so on and so forth. So, so a lot of people have um, suggested that Jap Japan's way of social distancing is one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Um, one of the sort of mysteries about Japan is that um, their perspective on testing is very different. It's very different than Korea and Taiwan. As you know, Korea and Taiwan have massive testings. Japan, um, not, uh, not so. And one of the reasons um, why the Japanese government hasn't been very active in testing is um, sort of, uh, if I can simplify the reasons to, down to two reasons. Um, one is uh, in 2009, the H1N1 flu um, hit Japan really, really, really badly. And at that time, people were flocking to the uh, uh, hospitals to get tested. And eventually, what um, it turned out that people were getting infected at the hospital while they were waiting to get tested. And so um, from that, the Japanese government uh, said that uh, that they will make strict guidelines as to who should be tested. And so the, the guideline is uh, as such. So if you have, um, so 
people who have had high temperature for at least four days. Um, people, so 37 and 37.5 and over for four days and uh, um, dry cough and so, sort of the, you know, the symptoms that, that, that we all know. So the dry, dry coughing, uh, fever for at least four days and um, sort of um, hard, you know, uh, uh, hard to breathe, you know, all these symptoms so for people that are showing these symptoms um, after the fourth day that they have the fever, then they can come to a testing. So they've been very, very sort of strict on, on who should be tested, who could be tested. And the reason why they have it this way is because of their sort of, um, uh, because of the 2009 flu. And uh, the other thing that, pe the, that specialists, you know, experts have said uh, about Japan is that Japan has taken an approach uh, of sort of, you know, coming to terms and living with Corona. So they have this sort of cluster, cluster based approach. And what that means is that um, they conduct uh, epidemi uh, um, epidemiological investigation in, uh, to establish the origin of, of the infection. So when there's clusters, they, they go and they find out you know, what the source is. And, that, and this is how they sort of approach um, uh, the measures against COVID-19 in Japan. And just um, in Japan, th in, they say that, uh, that many of the news have reported in Japan that um, PCR test, which is the test that people get um, to, to see whether they have the, the, um, uh, the virus or not. Uh, apparently, uh, in, in Japan, they say that 20, there's, the reason why they're not very active in doing PCR uh, testing is because they have false um, uh, results. So it is said that 20% uh, so in the PCR test results into about 20% of false negative and then 30% of false positive. This is what they say here in Japan. I did look at some of the other sort of news sources in North America and Europe, and they have different numbers. But in Japan, this is what they say. So um, people are, 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 are um, suspicious or you know, they're skeptical of, of the PCR test itself. And because of what happened in 2009, they're even more reluctant to do the test. So this is this is sort of um, what's happening here in Japan. And just to show you a um, couple of photos. So this is, so this is a, a photo of um, the um, uh, ceremony for the beginning of the new school year for uh, elementary school. Um, and uh, you see that they have um, taken um, the taken measures for social distancing. So uh, most schools in Japan, um, once they did reopen, they had, uh, they had, the schools have taken their own measures. Of course, um, upon the, uh, the uh, supervision by, by the national governments and local governments. And this is sort of, you know, um, now the, they say in Japan, sort of the, um, uh, a new, new life with COVID-19. So there's a Japanese word for that. Shinseikatsu yoshiki in Japanese. And so this is um, sort, of, sort of the, sort of the new, uh, way of of conducting ceremonies, you know, for for children, for school children. So this is this is um, sort of sort of symbolic of this Japanese social distancing, the the avoiding of the three C's. And this is um, it, the airport in Kansai or Osaka. Um, some of you who've flown to Japan might have flown through uh, Osaka uh, Airport, International Airport. So you see this uh, the uh, ground um, staff holding the sign. Uh, please keep apart. So you see this, you know, everywhere in Japan, you know, you go to a restaurant, you go to a theater, you go to the airport, you'll see, you know, these signs saying, please keep apart. Okay, um, measures against COVID-19 in Korea is very different, as you know. So in, in Korea, they've been doing massive testing. I mean, so the infamous drive-through, walk-through testing, this is where it happened. And uh, they started um, strict quarantine at the border already in January. Um, this is also quite um, uh, something that uh, uh, a lot of people, I mean, there's, there's sort of the pros and cons of, of, of this. Some people uh, absolutely agree that this is a great thing. Some people think this is not a great thing, but um, the Korean government had set up apps you know, for smartphones and they track people uh, with the COVID-19. Um, and uh, they've, or they had already um, implemented these tracking devices, you know, these tracking apps or as early as January. Um, this is almost two months before uh, WHO declared the, the, the virus as a pandemic. So, I mean, that's quite early. It's, you know, they've, they implemented this in, at a cr uh, quite early stage. So, uh, again, just to show you some photos, you know, this is the infamous drive through. After Korea started it, everybody thought this was a great idea. Um, and so um, you see 
countries in Europe um, and also uh, some cities in North America and also in Canada that have, have um, set up these drive-through sort of testing um, uh, uh, laboratories. Uh, this is the uh, app, right? So, and they have it in multiple languages and it's really easy to download. You know, you just you press a button and then and it downloads onto your smartphone. And then this is, um, so for those people who, um, violated their quarantine. So they, the, the, the Korean government implemented this wristband. So again, there's, there were pros and cons about this. People, some people thought this was a terrible idea because obviously these wristbands, usually they use it for crim to track criminals, right? So, um, but they said that, you know, um, uh, difficult situation calls for, you know, hard measures. And so they did uh, implement it. They, they implemented this sort of like tracking device for those people who had, you know, violated their, their quarantine. Okay, um, next I will talk briefly, briefly, briefly about sort of the challenges that, that sort of uh, that were revealed, you know, un, uh, amidst sort of the uh, COVID-19. So uh, in Japan, of course, um, and this is, this is not new to, to all of you, you know, Abe is, uh, Prime Minister Abe, he's the longest serving Prime Minister in Japan. You know, his le leadership, you know, sort of leadership slash competence under COVID-19 uh, was, um, un was, you know, uh, very much sort of people were very skeptical about his comp compet uh, competence. Um, so uh, in Japan, there's sort of, there has been series of these, you know, um, leaders that lacked sort of strong leadership in crisis management. Um, one that sort of stands out is during the, the massive earthquake we had in March 11, 2011. That was um, when the opposition party, what is now the opposition party, the Democratic Party was in power. But you see again with the LDP, you still see sort of a lack of strong leadership um, in crisis management. Uh, a lot of people were very. A lot of people are were and are very dis dissatisfied with the very slow sort of sort of um, pace of the uh, the Japanese government implementing you know measures against COVID nineteen, um, and you see sort of this sort of emergence of cracks within the ruling coalition, um, and uh, and so the reason the. The reason why Abe was sort of very passive in implementing anything in, in, uh, during the beginnings of COVID-19 was, of course, as you know, um, he was worried about two things. One was uh, the visit by Xi Jinping. Um, and uh, the second one was, of course, the Olympics. So he was very hesitant to close the borders because if once, if and one, when he did close the borders, obviously that would be very detrimental to the Olympics and also to uh, the visit by Xi Jinping. Of course, Xi Jinping canceled. And then uh, the IOC also, um, you know, said that that we should delay the Olympics. So for the time being, it's been delayed for another year. I'm very skeptical that it's going to actually take place. Um, but that those two things were, you know, very much an issue for Abe, and this is why he was very slow in the beginning of implementing anything um, to to combat uh, COVID-19. And also another thing that has been um, mentioned about sort of Japan's sort of reaction to COVID-19 is that um, they were very also also they are very slow in um, uh, composing uh, experts panel uh, and um, uh, so the COVID-19 obviously you know there was it was already spreading in January but it wasn't until uh, mid-February that the what Abe had uh, instructed to um, compose an experts panel uh, on um, disease control. And one very big difference um, between Japan, uh, Korea, Taiwan is that Japan doesn't have a CDC. And so this is why he had to, you know, he had to rush and, and uh, compose this experts panel. But again, this didn't take place till mid-February. So everything was, you know, you know, too little, too late kind of thing. Um, but that was the case. And also, um, some people have also criticized that because Japan doesn't have a CDC, that it was not the experts of, of disease control that were calling the shots, but it was the bureaucrats who weren't experts. So these are some of the things that that sort of kind of was revealed, are being revealed about Japan um, amidst this, you know, COVID-19. Uh, one of the one of the sort of um, interesting things. Uh, I'll, this is the last thing I'll mention about Japan is that, um, in terms of political challenges, uh, you see a little so it's more sort of stronger presence of local governments and leaders. So of course, you know, Japan. There's 47 prefectures in Japan, and different prefectures are uh, affected differently by COVID-19. 
And because the national government was really slow and, and everybody was dissatisfied with the way Abe was taking care of this situation. So you see, um, even though Japan is very centralized, as you know, uh, it's a very unitary system, uh, very centralized government, local leaders have sort of um, uh, stepped it up a little bit, uh, stepped it up a lot in some places uh, uh, under COVID-19. Um, and they've demonstrated their leadership uh, by introducing, you know, sort of their unique um, policies uh, uh, in di different sort of pre prefectures. Uh, this is um, what um, the governor of Tokyo did in the past, in the a uh, couple weeks ago. So, uh, as you know, um, uh, Madam Koike, she was re-elected as the governor last week, and before the election, of course, you know. Um, she was on TV every day, you know, um, and she was explaining to the, the people of Tokyo, you know, the situation of COVID-19, and she introduced this uh, red alert, so Tokyo alert. Uh, this is the um, big bridge in Tokyo, in the middle of Tokyo, it's the Rainbow Bridge, and uh, what it was was if, if um, the days where there's a large number of infected people, uh, the bridge would light up red, they would light it up, and then it would, which um, meant for people to, you know, restrain themselves from going out. So it was, a, it was a sign, right? And because it's, it's a bridge that's in the middle of Tokyo, and, and a lot, a lot of, not everyone, of course, but you know, pe people can see it from their buildings, from their, you know, so from, from their local sort of, you know, um, uh, place sort of um, where they're living, their residence, and so uh, people are, would be able to check to see, you know, what the status was. Uh, this is the government of Hokkaido, uh, which is, is where I'm situated in, um, and this is um, uh, Governor Suzuki, and he was one of the, uh, he, he first, first of all, he is one, he's the youngest governor uh, in, in, in Japan. He's, uh, I think, just a little bit over 30, which is very unusual in Japan, um, and uh, he, he was very, um, so he, he showed a lot of leadership from the beginning, uh, Hokkaido was was one of the largest affected area in in Japan fr from the beginning of COVID-19 because it is a tourist destination is one of the most popular tourist destinations and so um, when uh, the numbers were uh, were increasing uh, professor uh, the, uh, the governor had um, uh, announced uh, emergency uh, declaration a, a local one uh, look I won't go too much into sort of, you know, the uh, jurisdictions of, of, of local governments and, and central government, but um, the local governments don't have the juridical sort of, just, they don't have jurisdiction to announce um, emergency that's legally binding. So when he announced this emergency, it was purely just sort of, a, it was more symbolic than anything. But a lot of people, um, agreed that this was a great idea because once the numbers were increasing in Hokkaido, after he declared the uh, emergency, it did go down a little bit in March. Um, and then he did, he, he resolved the uh, emergency, but then again, after that, it, it rose again. So he declared the second one. Uh, that was when the, the national government also declared, declared an emergency. But you see these local governments, these lo young leaders in these um, sort of, um, local governments that are showing this, you know, sort of strong leadership in, amid sort of this, you know, uh, crisis in Japan. So this is, um, it's, it, it, I think it, it's a, a new trend, which I think is a good trend, uh, because, you know, in Japan, there's, there's, again, like I said, 47 prefectures uh, with, you know, um, different, they have, they have, they're facing different challenges. So um, even though, I mean, the, the problem is that Japan is, is very centralized, but maybe perhaps this could be um, a, um, a turning point for local governments and, and devolution. Uh, we'll have to see, but, but this is something that, that um, sort of uh, something that we've noticed uh, under this COVID-19. Okay, uh, next. Uh, political challenges in South Korea, um, a little bit different. So the, in, the situation in Korea is a little bit different. Um, my explanation about Korea will somewhat be more sort of um, more about the uh, administration in general per se. Um, so Moon, uh, the president, uh, President Moon's support rate, his approval rate was actually quite low uh, towards the end of 2019. And in the beginning of 2020, when COVID-19 hit Korea, he was, you know, he he showed really strong leadership, and um, and he he closed the borders. You know, he started the massive testing, and people really um, supported this. So uh, you you saw this sort of like drop in the support rate for Moon 
towards the end of last year, but a, a, like inc like rapid increase in, in uh, January and February when he demonstrated his competence against this um, uh, this uh, virus. And it was, you know, it was actually an opportune moment for Moon, uh, for Moon Jae-in and also for the Democratic Party because they were, um, it was, it was, uh, they were leading to the general election, which took place in April 15th. So um, Moon's support rate uh, increased in, uh, from, Monday, uh, from uh, January to February, all, all the way up to March. And then it sort of it led to the uh, general election. It was a huge win for the ruling party. And so for Moon's administration, um, this COVID-19 came, I mean, it's, it, 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 I, I, Mm, sort of trying to find the, the best word for it, but but it was sort of an opportune moment for him when because his support rate was really um, uh, going down at, at the end of 2019. So uh, they won the election, you know, great. Um, the the numbers of infected people were you know um, decreasing, and they thought that that uh, um, this you know that the the ruling party and President Moon were quite happy as to you know the results that they were able to to um, come up with, with you know, fighting COVID-19 and whatnot. But since then, uh, in the last couple of months, uh, there has been a few things that happened in South Korea. One, of course, is the deterioration of relations with North Korea, symbolized by the blowing up of the joint liaison office. Housing prices are on the way up. Uh, Seoul is not, uh, Anissa might, will be able to probably tell us this, you know, Seoul is not uh, a cheap place to live. It is one of the most expensive places to li live, uh, yet housing prices are still on the rise. Um, Me Too related issue, as you know, um, the uh, mayor of Seoul, um, Park Won Soon, just committed suicide because, um, just not too long ago. So all of these sort of um, incidents have been detrimental to Moon Jae-in. Um, and his approval rate is, uh, is, is, is rapidly, rapidly uh, uh, going down. So just to show you some numbers here, uh, this is from Gallup, uh, Korea. So Moon's support rate, as you see, um, support is the dark blue line. You see that in January, uh, February, it's um, about 40%-ish, just a little bit about 40%. And then uh, by April, just before the general election, it goes about above 50. And after the general election, it was actually even more than that. It went out all the way up to 60 in the 60 percentile um, uh, area. Uh, but now it's back down to, I think, 40. I think it might have... Um, uh, cracked 40 percentile. I think it's like 30 something now. So it's 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 on the way down. Um, the voting intentions, uh, as you see, again, the Democratic Party, the ruling party, is is the blue line. Um, uh, you see that by weekly data, the respondents, you know, they have um, said that they do. Uh, uh, they would they would vote for the Democratic Party. So you see that there's a massive increase towards March, uh, sort of end of April, uh, beginning of April. Okay. Um, I did promise I will finish in 30 minutes. So I think I have another five minutes. Um, I'll try to go through the next few slides as quickly as possible. Um, so this is sort of uh, up to this point. Um, my presentation is basically um, some sort of information that you probably all know. Um, but from here is, is sort of um, my research sort of theme. You know, I work on um, marginalized people, minorities, and so on and so forth. So um, this is this is where um, I my, most of my work is. Uh, focused on. So uh, so amid COVID-19, you see um, the marginalized people becoming more marginalized in Japan and also in Korea. Uh, let me start off with Japan first. So um, as you know, Japan uh, is now um, increasingly accepting more foreign migrant workers uh, to, to Japan. I won't go into the detail of the, you know, sort of the policy. Um, if you have any questions about Japanese immigration policy, you can ask me during the Q&A. Um, but uh, because Japan is one of, one of the most rapid aging society and with a, a fertility rate of, of 1.4. Uh, so, I mean, it, so the population is decreasing um, by quite a bit. So uh, Japan has to rely on um, foreign labor. Uh, so this is why Japan has now um, implemented a couple of new policies to accept more migrant workers to Japan. Now, I mean, um, so, so, so it's a... It, you know, in, in, in cases of migration, you know, you, if it's win-win, it's great, but usually it's not. Usually it, it's the migrant workers that, that end up with the short end of the stick per se. Um, during COVID-19, of, of course, this is not only in Japan, this is, I mean, this is not unique to Japan, but in many countries around the world, foreign migrant workers were the first ones to be fired. Um, but the problem with COVID-19 is that 
even though they're fired, the borders are closed, so they can't go back to their country. So they're all stuck in limbo, right? Because they can't, they can't work in Japan. They can't move it. So, I mean, uh, many people have, have no means to move around uh, Japan because they don't have a contract. They don't have a visa. They can't go to another prefecture to find a new job um, because they're, once they're fired, they have no reason to be in Japan. This is how Japanese visas work. So once they're fired, their visa is nullified, then they have uh, no choice but to return home. But because of COVID-19 and because of the closure of borders, they're, they're not able to go home. So they're kind of stuck in Japan without a pay, without an income. Uh, in some places, for some people, um, no place to stay. So, I mean, it's, it's, it can't be worse. Um, in Japan, still, you know, uh, uh, foreign migrant workers are, you know, disposable, you know, they're precarious um, foreign labor. So um, it, it's a serious situation in Japan where you see um, some prefectures with a large number of foreign migrant workers, where these people, you know, the migrant workers, you know, in the worst case scenario become homeless. Um, some people um, go hungry because they don't have they don't have money to pay for their food. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a quite serious situation. Uh, for Korea, um, there are two things that I want to mention. So, um, uh, with the spread of COVID nineteen, so the Moon Jae-in um, government was very active in trying to uh, contain this this virus in the beginning of January and um, also in the beginning of February, and the numbers weren't weren't high at all at that time. But as you know, in, by mid-February, there was a massive outbreak of COVID-19. And where did that take place? It took place at religious cults, right? Um, uh, the, the famous one that was all over the news was Shincheonji. Now, it's a, it's a, new, it's a new, relatively new religious cult. Um, but what, what people found out after um, when, when this sort of massive um, sort of uh, outbreak of, of COVID-19 hit this religious cult is that a lot of young people were uh, members of this religious cult. And um, not only just young people, but uh, also um, uh, at the time people, uh, there were also uh, uh, civil servants, you know, government officials, you know, a lot of, you know, um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say high profile, but yeah, people, you know, with very stable jobs, you know, you know, certain social status, uh, they were all involved in this religious cult. And the reason why there was a massive outbreak was because when there was that patient, there, uh, I think patient number 61, I think it was, um, she was a member of this religious cult. Um, she refused to get tested, right? And she was a super spreader, that's what they say. And, uh, and people didn't want to come out and get tested because they were worried that people would then know that they were from Shincheonji. And because, you know, obviously people don't, Korean people are very, um, uh, they, they're very secretive of, of their sort of, um, affi you know, affiliation, especially if it's a religious cult, um, you know, m m uh, all the more they would want to hide that. And so this is why people uh, um, didn't come out and get tested. But then, then, then people, you know, started you know, showing the symptoms. So at the end of the day, eventually they, they all had to get tested. And they, they, then it turned out that they were all from this one religious cult called Shincheonji. Um, and what I wanted to say about Shincheonji was that um, uh, what, I, what I was shocked about this was that uh, a lot of young people, people from the age bracket of 18 to 25, they were members of this, this uh, religious cult. And there was a, a pretty high percentage of these young people participating in this religious cult. And, and I just, um, for a, from a different research that I do, uh, just to give you some numbers. So um, in Korea, the relative poverty rate is 7.4%, which is the highest among OECD countries. Now, the poverty, poverty rate of people in the age range of 18 to 25 is about 13%. So, you know, what, what this implies, um, and again, Anissa, if you have any uh, sort of insight to this, I would appreciate that, is that a lot of young people are, are very frustrated. I think they're very frustrated that they don't have jobs, they don't have a, a bright future. There's, there's a, a Korean um, phrase called a dirty spoon, which is compared, sort of, which is contrasted to a silver, silver spoon, or in, in Korea, they say a gold spoon. So basically these, these young people, uh, um, who are who are from you know families of you know low to mid class you know families, um, they they already kind of know um, that that uh, they might not get the best jobs um, because their parents can't afford to send them to cram schools. 
they'll end up going to a sec, you know, not the first tier universities, not the sky universities, as they say in Korea, not Seoul, Yonsei, Korea University, but, you know, some maybe like a local university uh, in, in some of the uh, other regions of Korea. So they, it's kind of panned out for them. You see what I mean? Like they, they, they kind of already know that, that, um, you know, their, their sort of lifetime salary will probably be a certain amount. They might not be able to, uh, to buy a house, most likely not be able to buy a house, probably not a, a car. Um, maybe, you know, slight, maybe they might not even get married because they won't be able to afford a family. So, so these, these students, uh, these young people are very upset and they're very discouraged and very disappointed because they have no one to turn to. And it's, it would be, and they realize it's really hard to change their sort of life course, their life. So um, in order to, you know, make new connections, in order to, you know, the, these young people need some place or like a, a, a place or a person that they can, that they can sort of, you know, find peace. And I think that's one of the reasons why um, these young people are going to these religious cults. The last one I want to talk about was the backlash against the LGBT, um, com LGBTQ community. Now, in uh, Korea, they, uh, it, of course, there is no census, right? Uh, um, they, they don't take the numbers for, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community. But it is said from, you know, the private sort of opinion, uh, pri private sort of um, uh, polls and, and, and questionnaires. Uh, it, they say that there's about maybe 10% um, of LGBTQ uh, in Korea. Now, um, again, in, in, uh, in Korea in April, um, there was another massive outbreak of COVID-19, which took place in a place called Itaewon, which is the entertainment district of Korea. Now, the entertainment, so this entertainment district is, is not only for LGBTQ, it's for, you know, young people in general, but there are a lot of clubs there um, catered to the LGBT community. Um, one, uh, a there was there was a, a a person who was infected with the COVID nineteen. Apparently, he spread it, uh, and uh, it turns out that he had gone from you know uh, one club to another, which was of course catered to LGBTQ, and they had to find these people who had got into close contact with this person. Uh, they tested five thousand seven hundred people. Uh, that was the five hundred seven hundred people that were in these clubs that night. Now again. Uh, it's, it was the same case as Shincheonji. People didn't want to come out and get tested because they were worried that they would be, they would have to, uh, they, they would, they would have to come out, right? So if, if they had come out and said, actually, I was in the club, even if they were not LGBTQ, if they, if um, they, if, you know, uh, their family found out that, that, that this person was there, you know, they could uh, uh, suspect that maybe he's LGBTQ or she is LGBTQ. So they, they didn't want that, they know, because there's still so much stigma against LGBT, LGBTQ. And so people didn't want to come out. They didn't want to get tested. They didn't want, they didn't want to tell people that they were there in Itaewon that night. Um, and because in, in some, in the worst case scenario, if they find out, of course, it's, it's, it's against the constitution, but they'll find some way to fire this person. So it's it's that bad, right? So, so the backlash and sort of the stigma against LGBTQ community is still very very strong in in Korea, and this is another reason why there was a massive outbreak because people didn't want to come out and get tested. Um, just to show, I'll end up. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll finish in about another two minutes just to show you some photos. This is um, a, a, a Buddhist temple in Nagoya in Aichi Prefecture, and these are all Vietnamese. Uh, foreign workers, all of them who are fired from their job, many of them working in manufacturing. And, uh, but because they cannot go home, they cannot fly back to Viet Vietnam, um, they found, you know, sort of, they, they uh, are finding this uh, Buddhist temple as a temporary home. And these two uh, gentlemen in the uh, uh, sort of in the front here, they're the two uh, monks that are taking care of these Vietnamese people. So, you know, there are some help from civil society to, to uh, you know, at least provide uh, these um, uh, migrant workers with some kind of housing and food. Uh, this is a temporary sort of dormitory that this um, Buddhist uh, monks had uh, set up for these Vietnamese people. Obviously, it's not, you know, it's, it's very temporary. Um, they're, you know, 
the, they're not real walls. They're not real partitions. It's just, it's just a, a cardboard, not, not so much cardboard, but it's, it's like a really thin wood, you know, plywood um, separating these people. Um, but, but there is, you know, some help from the civil society. Uh, this is the famous photo on, from BBC, um, the Shincheonji, right? This is uh, the, the religious cult where there was a massive outbreak of COVID-19. Um, of course, um, you can't see really clearly, but if you, if you do uh, look at the um, uh, documentary or the, the, the clip, uh, you see there's a lot of young people there. Um, this is Itaewon. This was where the, the, the second sort of massive outbreak um, occurred uh, in the sort of entertainment district of Korea. Um, the last thing, one last thing I want to say uh, is, so um, what does COVID sort of 19 reveal about East Asia in general? So relations in East Asia, of course, could be better. Um, that's, that's, that's the best way I can phrase it. Um, but even amidst this sort of global pandemic, you don't see any cooperation among East Asian countries. First of all, Taiwan's not a member of WHO. They were sitting, they were, um, uh, they're, of course, uh, Taiwan, uh, there's a whole that, that could be a, a whole you know uh, lecture in itself. Taiwan um, uh, cannot participate in many of these UN um, frameworks, uh, but they were observer on WHO. But even that is now um, uh, that that is no longer the case. So Taiwan has to come up with their own um, coronavirus or COVID-19 measures. Uh, so leaving that point aside, uh, even among Japan, Korea, China, uh, there are literally no cooperation. So just um, when the COVID-19, when right, right after WHO had declared this as a pandemic, uh, on March 20th, there was a foreign ministers uh, meeting, a conference call, and they promised to establish a health ministers meeting, you know, so that they can discuss about uh, uh, potential cooperation. April, to, a month after April 21st, um, they also um, had another foreign ministers um, conference call. And then on 30th, uh, they had conference call between the undersecretaries of foreign affairs. And in March, on March 20, they already had discussed about establishing a health ministers meeting. It wasn't until May 15, which, which is a couple months ago, um, that they held, that they actually held a health ministers meeting. Um, but this health ministers meeting has been around for quite a long time. Um, it's been around since 2007. And of course, um, they meet uh, when there is an outbreak of, of a virus. Uh, up until now, you know, the influenza virus, every year it hits Japan, every year it hits Korea, you know, China. And so they held these the health ministers meeting to share information um, and to, you know, uh, find, to discuss possible ways of cooperation. And this was very, uh, this was very uh, effective um, in the, um, uh, during the outbreak of the influenza virus H1N1 in 2009, um, but uh, during COVID-19, they have um, had they haven't they had they only met uh, on May 15th, you know, a couple months ago, and um, there you see that there's sort of a lack of sort of the willingness to cooperate with each other, even under a global public health um, uh, outbreak, a public health um, uh, disaster. And uh, just to finish off, um, this is a, a quote from uh, Professor Okonogi. He's a, 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 a professor at Keio University, uh, Professor Emeritus at Keio University, who um, is a specialist on East Asia. And uh, he said that sort of, um, this is what he said. He said, it seems that the respective governments find it difficult to talk about mutual support and cooperation due to the negative, to the possible negative reaction from its people, even though there is a framework to cooperate on public health issues. So um, clearly, there is sort of a lack, sort of a lack of willingness to to cooperate with each other. Not so much because you know, they don't see eye to eye, but they all, more, I think, as um, what is sort of indicated by Professor Okonogi's quotation here is that they feel that that the, there might be negative reaction from the people if they if they see that they're you know if you know Japan Japan and Korea obviously have their issues um, concerning you know historical textbook and comfort women and so on and so forth and so these kinds of these kinds of sort of like uh, these um, uh, issues are now uh, sort of affecting um, public health issue as well so even if there is a is a pandemic that is occurring right right now as we speak they're very hesitant to to cooperate because they might they, there might be some negative reaction from the people because of um, stemming from um, other sort of historical issues.
So um, those are so that's sort of my tentative observation of what's happening in Japan, Korea, and sort of you know my last sort of uh, observation is about East Asia in general. And um, that is it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naomi. Uh, very interesting presentation. Very, uh, I think, very important uh, explanation of several things that actually happen in 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 Japanese society and also in Korean society, but. To add to that, we have uh, Kassan, my colleague, my friends from the Korean University. Currently, she is doing her PhD, a Graduate School of International Studies at the Korean University in Seoul, uh, Ms. Anissa Pratamasari. So I will I will let her uh, comment on Naomi's uh, explanation, presentation, and also add to that her experience probably in, in especially in Seoul I think I think that will be a very uh, important addition to our discussion uh, Anissa it times yours yeah thank you so much for that actually for the super spreader from Sitonji she's patient number 31 no not 61 no more mission it was 61 but she was patient number 31 and she, actually I heard last time during April or something, she hasn't recovered from the COVID-19, so she was still in the hospital. And that actually adds to the stigma of the Sinchonji cult because in Korea, the government takes care of your treatment fees and hospital fees and testing fees, so it's all free, unless you, you want to be tested without any symptoms. So if you, I mean, like if you happen to be in the same places with all of these confirmed patients, you can actually ask for free tests and for the treatment, it's free. So that's that's why the patient 31 who caused the major outbreaks in Korea, she spent months in a hospital and of course the government have to pay for that. It's adding up to the more stigma towards the cult. And not only the cult actually, I heard when Daegu had their outbreak, they were kind of like rejected to come to any cities. Like for, for example, my friend had a friend from Daegu and they will be like, don't come here to Seoul, something like that. So they also face that kind of discrimination as if they are a furious carrier, even though they don't have anything. That's also one of the problem happens in, actually happens in Seoul. And also for the, um, the third spoon and golden spoon. Yeah, I think Naomi already explained it very well. That's actually what happens. And I heard that Sinchonji cult actually felt very welcoming and kind of like listened to the youngsters problem. So that's why they, the youngsters felt that they're very sympathetic and they can somehow get kind of social support from, from the cult. This part is like, we can debate whether it's right or wrong, but in so Korean society, I mean, living daily is already very competitive. It's even, I, I'm in Korea University, but I'm a foreigner and I'm in graduate student, so I don't really feel it. But for for those Koreans who kind of like get accepted to Korea University or one of the Sky University, they kind of like felt very the burden and they have the pride, but they also have the burden to kind of like live up to the name of the university. They study very hard, they barely find time to like kind of have fun and something like that. So the pressure itself and the competition inside the society is very hard. So I, I think, I guess that's also why they kind of like try to find any solace to the, in, in terms of cult and something like that. And for the, I want to add up, I don't, actually, I don't really understand about the housing prices uh, or housing policy in Seoul. I just can say that it, yeah, it's very hard it, it's very expensive to even rent a room. Like my room here is a Koshi one and it's already like 300,000. I heard like 300,000 for Koshi one is very expensive, but it's actually the cheapest price that I can find in near my university area. So yeah, it's very expensive and even more expensive if you want to start a family because it means that you have to buy your own apartment. It, cost a lot and previously the Seoul government have kind of like subsidized a lot for people to be able to buy their own houses but I heard that nowadays they cannot do that any longer so that's why housing price became one of the major issues in the election itself and for 
the approval rating of Moon Chain. Yeah, it's. I heard that this few weeks because of the Seoul Mayor suicide case, and it's linked to Me Too movement. It kind of like sunk <laughs> the below fifty percent because before the election it was like sixty percent or so. Now we already saw us the right the graph. So yeah, it's kind of become very low nowadays, and people don't have this kind of like good perceptions on the Democratic Party. It will not, I think it will not influence any kind of like election outcomes or any way because it's done done and Moon Jae-in can only finish his term. But yeah, people don't like him nowadays, especially the approval rates kind of like declined mostly among women, not men. It just hurt. I just read one of the newspaper article. And for the marginalization thing, it's actually funny for the for me for the uh, because I'm a foreigner here. For the Itaewon case, the sus the confirmed patient was actually a Korean, and Itaewon was Itaewon is a kind of like multicultural districts, so it is very very popular among foreigners, not only. Yeah, it has so it has many clubs. Some of them are like LGBTQ clubs, and the patient was found in a, one of those many LGBTQ clubs. But because the district is very famous among foreigners, so many expatriates, students, workers, foreigners, workers, they just went there to have fun almost every week. So we uh, the foreigners also like stigmatized. I heard in some places they kind of you know, because most of foreigners here are teaching English some of them kind of like get fired without any explanations yeah it's illegal but they find like reasons or excuse like what Naomi said and some of them are like rejected to you don't have to come to work indefinitely because the school or the Hakon or the academy suspected that the teacher went to Itaewon the refuse day so they cannot even come out with that they cannot even tell the workplace that I want some days off because I need to get tested because the, the academy or any place they work at will, will be like, oh, you were in Itaewon, something like that. And it, it can, I mean, cost them to lose their jobs. Nowadays, it's already very hard to find a job. And for the daily life itself, for not only since Itaewon, but actually since the first COVID-19 issues, there were some restaurants in Seoul that actually have this paper plastered on in front of the door saying that Koreans only, no Chinese, or even like no foreigners. There are some restaurants like that. Even until now, there were like some, my friend just found a restaurant near my, uh, near my area that still have like Korean only papers plastered in front of their kind of door. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's kind of like very discriminatory towards the foreigners who currently live here. And what should I add? Uh, for the government it, uh, themselves, for they actually have this emergency relief, they actually give some cash to the household. It, it varies if you just one person household, they will give you cash like 400,000 won. And then for two person household, they will give you 600,000. And for three person household, they will give you like 800,000. And the government also provides some kind of cash measures for small business that went kind of bankrupt and in difficulties during COVID-19. Yeah, they you, basically I heard that you can just apply online and then the government will just transfer you the money directly to your account. But again, this is only applied for Korean, not not for foreign residents. Even those with like working visa here, they don't the foreigners here don't get any. Even for the mask, like initially the government secure all of the supplies. They bought all of the masks and they have like ration. Uh, buying per person. Initially, the only Koreans can buy. Foreign residents cannot buy anything, any mask during the first two months. And they just started uh, to allow foreigners to buy masks on April, if I'm mistaken, only once a week. I think, yeah, there are some kind of 
discriminatory measures in terms of uh, the locals and the foreign people here. I think that's that's all I can add. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alisa. Uh, Naomi, do you have any uh, comments on that, or we can we can move also to the question and answers question? I think we have a lot of questions from the. Sure. Um, uh, if you would allow me, um, maybe just yeah, yeah. one or two minutes. I just wanted to show you, um, again, because um, we can't travel at the moment, so I thought maybe I'd show you some photos um, to, just to sort of let you know what, what's going on here and what's going on in, in Korea. Um, so this is a PowerPoint that I pre prepared for uh, another um, uh, presentation. But uh, so here on to the left, um, Anissa, this is probably what you're referring to. Yes. So you see these restaurants in Korea. It says, uh, yeah, de, de so it means like, uh, that means uh, no entry of Chinese people. I mean, it's, it, they bluntly put a sign saying no entry. Um, again, this is also uh, um, another sign, excuse me, don't want Chinese people come to the restaurant because of coronavirus. So you know, you see, you see these kind of you know, signs and posters. Um, sorry, uh, this is here in Japan. Um, this onto the left here, it's a, a famous um, sweet uh, sort of um, uh, shop uh, in, I can't remember, I think it's in Hakone. Yeah, it's, Hakone is sort of where the hot springs are, the onsen. Uh, it's a very popular, uh, again, popular tourist destination. It says in Chinese, you know, please don't, Chinese people are not allowed here. Um, also, this onto the right hand side, this was a, a sign that was put up in a ramen shop here in Sapporo. It was very, very embarrassing and just very disappointing. Uh, this is the city that I live in. So, but uh, quite famous ramen restaurant. Um, and it says, of course, you know, no Chinese uh, people allowed uh, here in, in, in the restaurant. So uh, you saw you, these, it, and it's not just one or two places, right? It was, I mean, pretty much many places uh, you saw these signs. And, there, and people weren't shy about it. I mean, you just, it was right, you know, it, it was in your face kind of thing, um, right there for people to see. And in some places, they might not have these signs or posters, but once you entered into the restaurant and you were speaking Chinese, they would, they would ask you to, to leave, right? So um, in January when, in, in February, when people are still allowed to come into Japan, allowed to go to Korea, uh, this was the case. Okay, th thank you, Nomi, for the for the additional points. Uh, I think we can move to the questions from the audience now. Uh, we have a lot of questions, and I think most of or, or some of them touch upon this issue of discriminations, uh, especially towards the foreign workers. So one question from uh, Johannes Ivan Adi Cristianto actually asked about the this uh, how what is the governments of Japan in his question, Japan is going to do to maintain the number of workforce, especially since uh, even before COVID-19, Japanese people, to, to his knowledge, is, are, are relatively exclusive towards non-Japanese people. So I think it's the same thing uh, about, uh, similar to what, what Anissa already mentioned in, in South Korea as well. So this, this attitude towards foreign workers, was it worsened during the, the COVID-19 crisis? And how the governments are planning to to substitute this this kind of uh, foreign workers, if if I mean if if the government of Japan and South Korea are choosing to focus on domestic workers, then. thank you for the question, uh, Johan. Was it Johannes? Uh, thanks I for think, the question. Yeah. Um, so in Japan, it, generally speaking, um, a lot of people uh, are. I mean, it, it's hard to sort of phrase it. Um, in, in general. Uh, I think Japanese people, there, some are quite accepting. I mean, to, to, to be very honest, people, some are very accept, uh, they're very accepting um, in places traditionally where there are a, lot, uh, a, a large population of foreign people in general, um, tend to be a little bit more open rather than some places where, you know, of course, some of the more smaller towns and villages are a little bit more cl closed in that sense. Um, I think the sort of the discrimination against migrant workers uh, during COVID was not not because they, they thought they were carrying the disease per se or the virus per se. It was more, I think, just um, uh, it, just in general, yes, there is not a very high acceptance, high acceptance of migrant workers in, in, in Japan. But, you know, of course, um, but I think to a certain degree, this, this is because of, of the way the government has repeatedly sort of phrased their 
um, position on immigration. And uh, so in, in Japan, of course, since the 1980s, when they revised the uh, uh, Immigration Act, uh, Japan has stated um, uh, formally that they will not accept um, sort of uh, non-skilled and less skilled workers to Japan. But that's just an official position they have. It's just in a different way, right? They have accept them as, uh, as trainees, right? They're sort of TITP, the, the, the mm -hmm. training um, uh, internship program. So, you know, basically having uh, these people come to Japan, um, working for, you know, uh, you know one, one year to three years, working in non-skilled um, uh, and less skilled workers. And of course, um, the problems that the TITP people face are just tremendous. You know, a lot of people, so the, the way they're portrayed is that they come, the TITP is, this is how it is. They come and they're trained, right? They're the, it's part of Japan's sort of ODA, right? So they're, they're, they're accepting these, it, and it's exactly the same in Korea, right? And so, so they, they accept these people and they, you know, Japan is transferring their technology, you know, um, to, uh, to these uh, young people, um, and you know they ex expect that they will go back and and utilize this new technology that they learned in Japan in their respective countries. That's just you know that you know everything looks nice from the outside, right? But once they come to to Japan, they realize it's exactly it's not not it's nothing like that they what they expected. You know, very harsh uh, working conditions. Um, sometimes they are not paid. Uh, sometimes their with their paycheck is with, withheld. Um, and, and a lot of, um, it's, and it's true that a lot of people do run away. Now, see, but when, when they pre present that in the media, they only present that side. There's these foreign trainees coming to Japan and they're running away. And, you know, they might be up to no good. Mm. But really, if you dig into the real reason, you know, of course, not everyone um, is running away because of harsh conditions. Maybe, you know, there are going to be some people that come that necessarily didn't want to work there, but you know, trying to find another, another way to stay in Japan. But but most of the case, um, uh, they they come and then they just you know they do they they do what they can, um, and of course they it, it's an income right. So they want to to keep the job and earn the income. You know, send it back home. You know, you know, take this. You know, get trained in Japan, go home, and you know, and. and they have all you know all these really good thoughts about you know, good you know good good thoughts, but then once they come and they 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 they're not paid, they're you know human rights violation you know um, then the only thing that they can do to protect themselves is to run away. But of course you know people perceive that to be as oh they're up to no good. They're coming in. They're becoming you know overstayers, and they're going to you know um, uh, they're going to become uh, they're going to commit crimes and all, sort of like that negative stigma uh, towards them. Uh, so that that is a big issue, to be very honest. So um, I think, and and the the Japanese government has said that they will accept highly skilled, right, foreign workers. And this is, you know, they they have all sorts of visas for these people, um, but uh, the percentage of people that um, acquire this visa, the high tech, sort of high, you know, um, highly skilled uh, um, professional visas, only is a small percentage, right? Mm. And that's not where Japan lacks labor. You see, so Japan lacks labor in non-skilled and less skilled work. So the Japanese government has to, uh, in some way, bring in these, these, these workers. So this is why they implemented a new visa status last year called uh, uh, des designated activity. And so this is a, a, it's a completely new type of visa. And it's, um, it, sort of, it, it was the first time the Japanese government ever sort of um, implemented a policy to accept uh, blue collar workers. I won't go into the details, but you know, it, um, these, the, peop the visas are for people working in manufacturing, also, um, uh, also uh, in care industry and so on and so forth. So not, not, not let non-skilled or less skilled per se, but like sort of mid-skilled um, work. And uh, because it's, it's only been implemented since last year, um, it's, it, it, it's hard to say like what kind of results it's, it's, it's bringing to Japan. Um, and with COVID, everything is shut down. So um, we're still not really sure as to what kind of results we'll be, we will be seeing about uh, of this new, new visa uh, status. Okay. Uh, it, uh, Itcha, do you have any comments on that issue, the issue of discrimination uh, against foreign workers or maybe foreign students? I think some, um, some questions also ask you specifically about how they actually 
uh, I think Ifa Kalifatu Sada also asked about uh, is there any difference uh, on how the government actually treat Korean and foreigners during the, the pandemic? Uh, for for me, there was like most most rather than bad be uh, rather than bad treatment. It's it's more like we kind of like being neglected here. I know that uh, when I returned to Korea from Indonesia on February, there was no measures at all, unless you were from Hubei province in China. But in late February and March, if I'm not mistaken, they already started to ban the entry of Chinese students at that time. And some countries that were on the list of the high high risk kind of countries, but they don't even ban anyone from other countries. But I I heard that during April or something, Korea government never banned anyone to come in. They just have this like obligatory quarantine, even for students. But like you know, some students already stuck in the country and they cannot go out anyway. So that's why the the school and the university the classes are still off online mostly, even though we, we do have on, offline class, but it's not that hard to be conducted. And for the treatment itself, uh, for Seoul only, I guess, the government gave us free mask for foreign students. But that's that's the only thing that I kind of like remember that they did for, for the foreign students here. They did basically almost like nothing, just like we kind of have to survive in our own. But another thing is for foreign students, because uh, like some of my friends, they work part-time, like legally or illegally, but because of the COVID-19, we, we cannot find any part-time works anymore. And then it's it's very hard for some of us to live here. But yeah, the government did, did not give us, or we are not even eligible to apply for any kind of emergency relief measures that's only for the Korean themselves so I think I guess that's how that's why it's not like bad treatment but it's kind of like neglect in so many ways okay. uh, tell me th there is there is one yeah, Do you yeah sorry I, I was just yeah, gonna add so, um, mm -hmm. the, so in Japan we also have this sort of um, uh, cash support from the government uh, every household um, gets 100,000 Japanese yen each um, and they, they go by the people registered at their uh, local um, city hall or local uh, ward office. And in Japan, uh, if you have a, a, a working visa, like I'm, I'm on a working visa, right? So I have a, a visa uh, where I can work at a university. So even a foreigner, even if, you're for, even if you're a foreigner, if you have a proper working visa, you can get this support. Now, um, many foreign workers in, in Japan um, who are on TITP, uh, they are not eligible. Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference. Of course, the, the, the reason behind that is because we are here, we're on a, a working permit, right? Whereas they are being trained. So that this, they distinguish the, the TITP and people with working visa. Um, and, but for students, foreign students, there was a huge controversy of you know uh, whether to allow uh, um, non-Japanese students to get uh, student support for under COVID-19. So, but there are a lot of professors in Japanese universities um, protested against this. And so there is some, there is some uh, support for uh, foreign students. But uh, one of the things that, one of the problems, the sort of problems that we're facing here at Hokkaido University uh, is that most students couldn't come. So the new students um, from, uh, that were to start in April, because our school semester starts from April, yeah? So they were all supposed to come at the end of March. None of them could make it because they had to shut, they shut the borders. And also um, in, uh, in countries where the Japanese government had stipulated that, that they are not able to tra travel to Japan, these, these countries, um, they had uh, told, they had you know, ordered the uh, embassies and also the consulates not to issue visas until further notice. Yeah. See. Uh, and also in Korea, some uh, some many universities student council they already have kind of like some petition and rallies for the universities to refund the tuition money for the spring semester. But 
by far only Konkuk University have or Kyonggi University have refunded the money. I think my university refused. For the, that's the only thing that the international students and local students ask for here. Okay, uh, I think we can uh, before we move on to a like a more systemic uh, questions uh, about the system in Japan and South Korea. I think there is one uh, interesting question from um, Maula. I think uh, uh, he asked about uh, the habit of wearing masks face mask and high level of hygiene, whether that actually contributes to this uh, kind of a success in, in com compared to other countries in Europe, for example. I mean, in Estonia, even the, the, the head of the health board uh, just uh, explained to us several days ago that masks is not, are not necessary and it's, it's actually uh, cannot help during this pandemic. So, I mean, Maybe that's that's one one thing. Before we, we I mean, we, this is part of the, this culture, uh, well, tradition of wearing masks in East Asia or in, even in Southeast Asia. Do you do you agree with that uh, uh, assessment, now? Yeah, um, to a certain degree, I think it helps. Um, of course, there are you know a lot of research now says you know different things about why you know East Asian countries were a are able to contain it rather than North America or Europe because you know the strands are different because they've mutated you know so I don't know the science behind the you know mm -hmm. COVID-19 but you know those are some of the some of the factors that people have talked about I think yeah in general public hygiene is is very important in Japan um, even before you know the flu even before um, you know COVID-19 a lot of people wear masks I mean I think it's just you know for allergies and and uh, whatnot um, what I was very um, uh, surprised about when I first came to Japan was that um, a lot of people were, were wearing masks, um, even during the summer and, and in the winter. I mean, in the winter because of, of cold and the flu in the summer, you know, because people um, were, were, uh, were uh, um, wearing it for allergy purposes and whatnot. Uh, so I asked, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, at that time I was a graduate student, so, you know, I asked my fellow um, uh, uh, office mate, you know, um, why he, he wasn't particularly sick. So I said, why, why are you wearing a mask? You know, you're not, uh, sorry, sorry. So there was a student, there was a, a, a friend of mine who wasn't sick, who, who was wearing a mask. And so he said, well, cause I don't want, you know, to get the disease. Well, okay. Yeah. That's, that makes sense. But then there was another person, um, who had a very mild case of it, like a very mild case of a cold, just coughing a little bit, but you know, uh, he insisted that he wear a mask. And I said, well, you know, it, I mean, I think to, you, you've recovered enough, you know, your cold isn't that serious. And he said that uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to give it to people. And that's very different. That's that mindset is very different than in North America. Like um, we don't, I mean, it's not that we don't care. We, we are very caring, loving people in Canada, but, um, but leaving that point aside, I mean, we don't really think about, you know, if I would be passing it on to someone else. So it's, I think it's just that mindset that, that surprised me when I first came. So I just, I kind of mentioned that sort of, sort of a, a cultural perspective. Um, but I, I think definitely like when, when people are wearing masks, um, I don't, again, I don't know the science. Maybe, maybe it isn't effective, right? I mean, they say these like, you know, uh, masks with PPE and FPE, these like really high, you know, um, uh, sort of these high uh, functioning masks with, with all sorts of like this filter. They say that, you know, it, it cuts the, the virus, you know, 80% or 90% or whatnot. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it works. I mean, I don't know if that's the key to the success, but I think if people, like if the majority of people are wearing it, I mean, then of course you feel sort of that, you know, sort of, you know, sort of a, a good sense social pressure to wear it, and you are careful, right? When you see someone wearing a mask, then you also uh, become very attentive of that, and you become more careful. And I think that is, is itself is is quite effective. Um, so, I mean, but it's a, it's a there is a good side and a bad side to that, right? So, you know, as a collective, yes, we should all wear masks. I mean, that's great, but if like for instance, if um, what one one of the problems we had here in Japan was that a lot of homeless people uh, didn't have money to buy masks. So you know when uh, Abe, Prime Minister Abe, had uh, decided that he was going to uh, make this mask and send it to all these people, um, like uh, the, there were we collected them. Like I don't know if this became news in Indonesia, but like the it's called Abe no mask. It's like it's this mask that he you know, uh, uh, especially prepared for, for COVID-19. And it's not very high quality. 
and a lot of people complain about it. But of course, you know, we spent all this money to make it. So what we did, what a lot of these um, uh, local NGOs, uh, NPOs did was, were that they collected them. Um, they, they made a sort of a collection box and people were able to put the masks that they didn't need. I, it was either A, do that or throw it away. So they put it in this you know, post box and then they collected it and they gave it out to homeless people, right? But if you were a homeless person and you didn't have enough money or you know, at, at, then by the end of January, masks are all sold out. So you know, even if you wanted to wear a mask, you couldn't get a hand, you, know, you couldn't get a hold of it. So if you're that one odd person not wearing a mask, I mean, there was, people would criticize you. Um, I personally didn't have that case. Um, but I know um, people here at my university that didn't weren't that weren't able to get a mask. That um, if someone came up to them and said, "You know, why aren't you wearing a mask? You know, this is terrible behavior, kind of thing." And you know, it's sort of yeah. that pressure. Mm -hmm. it, it can work both ways. It can work in a good direction, and it can work in a bad direction. Okay, thank you, uh, Naomi. Uh, the there are questions about uh, the relationship between uh, Japan and China, and also Japan and South Korea, especially uh, during this uh, or maybe after the pandemic. Uh, whether uh, I don't know, do you think? I, I, I think you mentioned in your last slides about uh, this cooperation, East Asian cooperation. Do you think there is a possibility of moving that forwards? Uh, I mean, before the, the pandemic, we know that compared to the other regions in, at least in Southeast Asia or in South Asia, East Asia doesn't have this kind of regional uh, cooperation arrangement between the countries. Uh, do you think that will continue uh, because of the pandemic or do you think that will, I don't know, but the pandemic then make Japan, China, South Korea, and then come together, uh, try to solve the problems together, as you said before? I'm usually very, uh, optimistic person, but this time I will have to be a bit pessimistic about it. I think just bilateral relations uh, uh, among East Asian countries is just, it's its never been, I mean, it's its its one of the worst I think I've ever, I mean, you know, from what I can take, I mean, it, it, is, it is not that great, to be honest. I mean, Japan, Korea, you see that, you know, before COVID-19 um, outbreak, you saw the the historical, I mean, of course, there's the long history of the historical issue between Japan and Korea, but um, now that was spilling over to trade war, right? So in the past, um, what, what's striking about the bilateral relation uh, between Japan and Korea nowadays, like contemporary sort of, you know, in, in contemporary days, um, before historical issues stayed historical, right? It, you know, it's like, it, they would argue, they would, you know, disagree on historical matters, but that, that is staying in, in that realm. But now it's spilling over. And that and this is, uh, this I find um, a little bit, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic that, that this is probably the new trend that these sort of historical dispute or territorial dispute is like spilling over. And, you know, we learn as IR, you know, poli sci students that, you know, uh, the, the theory of rational choice, obviously we know that this is not true all the time, um, but you see that the, it's detrimental for Japan and Korea, you know, this trade war, yet um, no one's, nothing's stopping them. Uh, so uh, Japan, uh, sorry, Korea has taken Japan to uh, the WTO, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic uh, that even after COVID-19, um, it's not going to improve drastically. Um, I mean, even, China even, even during the, even for the citizens. I mean, I think one of the questions from Ari from uh, actually asked about the perception of mm -hmm. the. South Koreans and Japanese towards each other during this this pandemic. Did, I mean, state to state cooperation or or this bilateral uh, relations between countries might be. Uh, I mean, as, not optimistic, but it's not uh, uh, compared to the people to people uh, operation. Then do you think it's the same? Um, I think, uh, yeah, so um, that's, that's a good point. So I was talking about sort of, you know, um, at the national level, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be a vast improvement, but uh, it, um, it, in the past and, and the present, and I think, you know, I can, I can, I'm not a fortune teller, but I think in the foreseeable future, I mean, um, people to relations have, uh, of course, it's been up and down, but I think in general, there is, there's a vast improvement um, with, uh, with, you know, uh, 
improvement in technology, like, you know, SNS, even though now we can't travel, you know, people still get loads of information off SNS. Um, people are, are communicating with each other. Um, there is, a, I think, a lot of, and also there's a lot of international solidarity, uh, you know, um, concerning different issues. Like, for instance, like the comfort women issue, there is a lot of solidarity uh, between people in Japan and Korea. There are a lot of people in Japan that work uh, in these, you know, civil society movements uh, concerning comfort women. So it's, it's. I, I don't. Um, I, I think that the the relations between the the people of the East Asian countries are. I mean, I don't think there's going to. Uh, I mean, it's not. It it it's not like the that. It's it's not sort of you know uh, the relations between bilateral relations between Japan and Korea. I mean that I, I don't think that will improve. But in terms of like uh, people to people relations, uh, movement of people, you know, once the, the borders are open, I'm sure people will come back uh, to Japan. I'm sure Japanese people will go to will travel to Korea. Um, and uh, I think but that's that's been sort of built upon like it, it for, for a long period of time. There's been a lot of exchange in different, you know, in uh, the exchange between Japan and Korea, Taiwan and Japan, you know, there's a lot of, you know, movement and, and solidarity uh, amongst the people. So, so I'm not pessimistic about that, I think. And I think that um, will in turn, I think, you know, and, and, and of course in the past, you see that the people have been able to, you know, sort of at least um, convince the government or at least, you know, sort of um, voice their opinion saying that, that, you know, we should improve our relations, uh, that, that will, that needs to keep going. And I think, and, and I know that that, that will keep going. Okay. Uh, I would ask each channel to, to, uh, comment on one thing that, uh, our department secretary asked, uh, Siti Susanto, she, uh, she asked about this, uh, social welfare system, uh, uh during the pandemic, uh, regarding this additional social safety net program. Uh, do you think that that also affects uh, what you see in South Korea, whether whether this kind of welfare state system in both South Korea and Japan actually helps the government or the society to, to deal with their problems during the pandemic? In terms of South Korea, I think most of the fund that the government has was from their national health insurance premium because it's like it's mandatory for everyone in Korea to sign up for the national health premium, even for foreigners. I think last year they already have these new immigration rules that say that everyone, including students, have to sign up for that. For students, it's like the lowest one, but it's actually very expensive. Like seriously, for students, it's like five, fifty-six thousand per month. Compared to 56,000 per month, I only paid for my insurance for one semester. It's only like 30,000 something. It's, the national health insurance itself, it's already very expensive and it's applied. I think that's one of the reasons why Korean government managed to get their fund from to fund all of this testing, massive testing and everything. And I don't know about the people, maybe also the technology helps compared to the I mean the society or, or the people it's just like their health system and their technology that helps the government can enable the government to actually kind of like provide this kind of fast tracking measures and everything and control the pandemic faster than the other do you, do you have any comment on that Naomi as well uh, yeah so um yeah, well the japanese system is also uh, very much similar right everybody we have a, a universal health care um each each person um pre pays a premium um according to their their uh income and when you go to the the, to the doctors you only pay 30 percent of the total price of of you know uh and uh uh, medicine is is quite cheap here too as well, um, and if you get prescription, it's, it's cheap as well. And you have options for generic. So yeah, um, definitely, of course, the the social system or the welfare system adds to the uh, success. Um, I think also, but uh, but on a different note, um, in Japan, every day now, um, the, well, the last actually four days, you see that there was this increase in in. Um, a rapid increase of infected people in, in Tokyo and uh, just the newspapers also th this morning as well. Um, the, there was an article saying that they were worried about um, bed, the, the number of beds at the uh, hospital. So it's, it's sort of a, a 
it's sort of a paradox. So Japan has one of the most, um, I mean, we have universal health care. Uh, Japan has one of the most advanced um, uh, health sort of, you know, medical uh, uh, sort of uh, facilities. Yet they're still concerned. I mean, the numbers are very low compared to Europe or compared to North America, uh, but um, they're worried that they're going to be running out of beds. So, um, it, so it, it's, it was kind of a surprise to me um, that uh, the the hospitals were were getting very uh, anxious because um, they, you know, every day, of course, there's a little bit of in fact, a little bit of increase of infected people, and and they're they're very very concerned that they're not gonna, they're not going they don't have enough capacity to hold these people. Okay, uh, the last five minutes. I think we have two more questions. Probably one from Diaz, uh, my good friend. Uh, he asked Naomi about uh, the social institution, the, the family situation during the COVID nineteen, uh, about the sexual violence in the family. I mean, in Indonesia. He said that because the you because of this kind of working from home situation, then you force the family, the husband and the wife, to to live together in a in a very long time. Usually they they I mean you know 8 a.m. and then until 4 a or 4 p.m. they are separated because they have to work. But now they have to live together for the whole period, and then it actually raises this uh, this issue of sexual violence and this uh, domestic violence against women. What did the same thing happen in Japan as well? Uh, same thing. Is, yeah. Hmm? Same thing is happening here in Japan. Um, a lot of people are are um, are now. I mean, uh, when the when COVID nineteen was spreading, people uh, were um, told to be working from home, um, and so yes, there were uh, there were uh, more people stuck at home um, in very vulnerable situations. Uh, I don't have a uh, sort of strict number. Um, I don't think there is any record yet, like, uh, but I know uh, the reason why I know this is because I um, have a, 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 I have a good friend who works at these uh, shelters. And uh, she said that there are a lot of people and that are calling in um, for help because uh, they are stuck at home um, with their very violent partner. Uh, so yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing is happening here. I know same things happening in North America. There's, there's a, a rapid increase of, of violence happening at home, um, and um, I know a lot of children, you know, um, who are now. Uh, there's there's another um, a contact that I have in Tokyo who works with um, uh, girls that have run away from home, and she sees an increase. She saw uh, an increase since a April uh, because these um, girls were being violated at home. Um, and so they are seeking help um, at these shelters. Okay, thank you, Nomi. Uh, do we have one last uh, comment from pa Vincencio? Do you want to ask them? <laughs> do you want to ask yes. the question directly? Yeah, okay. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, your video you. is still off. But... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, actually, partly of the thing that I'm going to uh, uh, get a response from Naomi and it's uh, already been asked by uh, Maula a little bit uh, earlier. Uh, something to do with uh, what I called uh, cultural attributes. Uh, I think uh, we now realize, of course, there are a lot of, um, I would say, uh, explanations to tell about why resounding success happens in Korea, in Japan, or the other way around in, in other, other parts of the world. But the, the thing that uh, is emerging at the moment, I would say from uh, East Asian countries, scholars especially, uh, these things, cultural attribute things, uh, which contribute. And it comes from very little thing about, uh, like Naomi said, uh, about uh, wearing mask, uh, practices of regular hand washing, uh, no physical greetings with hugs or uh, handshakes like in Indonesia or India, for example. And it goes to some, I would say, um, how do I say it? Uh, things that we cannot see, but it's cultural things. Like, um, let's say in East Asian countries, they would say about the uh, Confucianism teachings about how much actually ex bitter, uh, bitter uh, past experience becomes a very cute learning for people to get uh, what they call now uh, social or high social obedience or uh, public uh, 
order like what is happened in Co- in, in South Korea, in Japan, or especially here in in Taiwan. My question is this: How much how much this kind of explanations also emerge within the scholars, let's say in Japan and in 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 South Korea? Because I see, for example, here in Taiwan, yeah, they they try to sort of believe and uh, develop this kind of explanations because it 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 is able to explain about the resounding success or almost complete success in many cases. But then it also, uh, the other way around, when we are talking about what is happening in US, in Brazil, in Mexico, or in India, or even in Indonesia. So, I mean, yeah, this is my, this is my, my question. Mm. How much do you see this is mm. becoming something that is attracting many uh, social scholars in either in Japan or in uh, South Korea. Thank you. Uh, it's a really good, uh, good point. I know um, in the beginning, uh, there were a lot of people on media in, J- in, in Japan, uh, these experts per se, that were, um, con- that were basically um, praising Japan's cultural attributes. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you say, you know, sort of um, the, the, the tradition of, of, you know, very sort of, um, maintaining public uh, hygiene. Sure. Uh, also the, the fact that we take off our shoes in, in Japan sure, sure. and in yes, Korea, yes, yes, that, yes. yeah, um, all yes. of the same. Um, I think, it, of course, it plays a part. Um, and I know there are um, uh, not so much, I, don't, I, I haven't really seen so much writing about that, like sort of scholarly writing, mm-hmm. writing but mm-hmm. definitely um, I see it on the media. Now, um, I'm, I, I'm, I always get a little bit tingly when I, when, when I hear this and, and see this on, on Japanese media, because obviously, you know, this adds to, you know, sort of the idea that Japan, you know, is, um, is, 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 a, is a great country. I mean, not that I'm sure. saying it's not, but, you know, sort of the, it adds to the sort of national pride. And I'm always, yes. always a little bit hesitant um, when people say, <clears throat> like, you know, Japan has been able to, you know, uh, combat COVID-19 because of you know, sort of cultural attributes. Um, of course, sure. it plays a part, definitely, but mm-hmm. but it's it, it 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 could be quite dangerous. That kind of discourse could be very dangerous, and and that's mm-hmm. I'm always a little bit mm, yeah sort of anxious about it. Um, also, I think, I mean, I see what's happening in North America, uh, Canada, not so much, but I know um, in the United States and in Mexico, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, in parts of Europe, there are um, sort of this you know massive outbreak because sure. people um, aren't you know. Uh, wearing the masks and you know there's they're they're claiming freedom you know freedom from not wearing mm-hmm. masks sure you know sure. but that's an extreme and then also i think to be very honest you know so sort of the the that that sort of high social obedience you see in east asia you know when it you know when it is in this in an extreme is mm-hmm. also very unhealthy so i mean i think mm-hmm. always to it's always best to sort of find a happy medium you know i'm all all for freedom of course but you know when it you know not at the risk of the bigger society, right? I mean, you know you can't go outside without a mask and 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 um, and say that's freedom. I mean, personally speaking, I think like you know when you are experiencing a pan- pandemic, of course, right? Um, but on the other hand, you know you see um, people who who just basically follow the guidelines. And, and that's great. People should, you know, when, when it comes to these, these uh, you know, uh, crises, people need to, you know, at least, you know, sort of follow the guidelines, but sort of the absolute obedience of, to anything is, is very dangerous. It m- makes people not think. And I think that's mm-hmm. the danger. Um, and so I, you know, people praise East Asia, especially East Asia, I think Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, uh, because there's such a high sort of you know rate of obedience, um, I would. It's not that I completely disagree, but I would argue. I also argue otherwise that that it it does sort of have it has its sort of dangers. Like you need you need people to think by by themselves as to how they're going to act. Yeah. Uh, so that that's sort of my take on it. Um, and the other thing uh, that I'm a little bit worried about. <laughs> Um, uh, is sort of the idea of privacy. Now, not so. So in East Asia, they have different takes, which is quite quite interesting. In Korea, um, of course, in the beginning, people were a little bit hesitant about having the apps and these tracking devices. But at the end, people agreed that this is a great idea. Um, when there was an out- outbreak at, in Itaewon, um, 
that uh, sort of the, L the LGBTQ community, what they did was um, they checked all the cell phone records oh. of the people that were in Itaewon that night with a cell phone, right? Because they have GPS. But they those can't. information, right? That, that kind of information is used only in extreme measures. Now, of course, we know, of course, COVID-19 is an extreme measure, but you know, again, I'm again always a little bit anxious when when you know governments governments step in and uh, use you know their power to obtain information that necessarily shouldn't shouldn't be theirs. Um, I, I I mean, of course, it's very effective, right? You have, they found five thousand seven hundred people. It's effective, but you know, what's what what are the prices that we're going to pay for that? Um, in Japan, this is quite interesting. A lot of people don't want this app, and they think that this tracking device is not a good idea. And there are people, um, you know, uh, sort of these commentators on 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 uh, Japanese media, sort of the sort of the right wing people, like you know, they're criticizing the way that Korea is doing their sort of measures. But you know, but even the, uh, those people cr criticize the way that Korea has been, you know, using these private information. But um, even even just in general, I think the Japan, people in Japan. Sort of hesitate, and they have their sort of sort of an allergy to to having these like tracking devices. So we, we don't have that here in Japan. Uh, whereas in, in Korea, of course, when they first implemented it, people were a little bit hesitant, but mm. but now they have no problem, and people actually think that that this was great, right? And I know in Taiwan they also had sort of very strict measures, and I know they had you know, these tracking devices. So um, again, you know, in desperate measures, we need you know very you know um, hard policies to. To, to contain you know uh, the crisis or contain the COVID nineteen, um, but but again you know we need to be very very careful as to as to how we move forward with this, um, and and we need um, you know specific rules. Um, otherwise, this could be used in a uh, you know you know not every in, in if it's used utilized in, in good ways then that's great. But but of course there's always that danger that it could be used for other purposes. And that's what I'm a bit worried about. Yeah, I also Thank agree you. with that because Thank actually you. in Korea, there were cases like we, we know since the beginning, the government used credit card, your credit cards and phone tracking to track where, your whereabouts. But there was one extreme measure that I feel a bit anxious was because uh, Korea had more imported cases than domestic cases around April or something. And there were several cases where the imported cases run away from their quarantine places. And the because in Korea, if you are under quarantine, the quarantine you have, uh, the government officers will call you like once a day, twice a day to check where your whereabouts from your cell phones. And some people just left their phones at home and they run away. So at that time, <laughs> the people, uh, Korean people were angry because they say, what do the foreigners do? To our country, something like that, and propose actually propose the use of electric bracelet, <laughs> just like how they track the sexual criminals. They kind of like controversial on so many levels. Just what normally <laughs> said, but I, I was surprised that people actually support that. It's, I mean, it's kind of like preaching your privacy. You're not sexual criminals, but you have to wear the electronic bracelet to trace where are you. <laughs> uh, There's kind of like balancing this between extreme measure for pandemic and actual breaching of privacy. It's very hard to do. And, and the fact that there's such a high percentage of people that support that, again, it's that high social obedience. Again, yeah. you know, um, you know, extreme measures, yes, but at the same time, you know, we need to, to think about this, right? Um, uh, so. I think it's important that each individual really sort of sits down and thinks about these things. But what, I, what, I'm, what, what I'm afraid is once, once, if and when COVID-19 does settle down, that people will forget. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and yeah, 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 uh, yeah. You, you see what I mean, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So hopefully, hopefully that um, people will, will pose a little bit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Snowmi and Icha. And it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's been a very interesting discussion, but we are running out of time. It's already nine minutes past our, our schedule. So uh, once again, thank you, Naomi, for, for sharing uh, your thoughts and your uh, research on, on minorities and migrant workers in, in, in Japan and South Korea, especially during this, uh, 
this pandemic and how they, the pandemic actually impacts their lives. And also for Anissa to comment and to add, uh, uh, to, to give additional points on the, the South Korean experience regarding COVID-19. I'm sure other people here, uh, I'm really sorry that we cannot discuss many more questions because there are a lot of questions regarding, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding the, the, the security, the, again, the, this, this uh, Japanese system. Uh, I don't know if Naomi would, I mean, if, if people want to ask you directly, would you be okay with that? I mean, uh, yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, if, 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 if well, you can just Google Naomi's name and it's, it's, it's the... I'll, I'll uh, send you, uh, I'll just uh, quickly send you my email address on um, the, on chat. the chat system. Yeah. yeah. So anyone can, can, it, that still have questions regarding uh, Japan and South Korea and migrant workers, again, minorities uh, can write to Naomi uh, directly. And also to Icha, I think Icha will, well, uh, well, we can discuss it later with Icha as well. <laughs> this, uh, okay, uh, yeah, Naomi already uh, put it there. Thank you, Naomi, again, well, uh, this is our Okay, this is the end of our discussion session. Before we go, I think we can do the usual photo session. <laughs> Again, uh, that's uh, our traditions together. Uh, so for those who are still here uh, and, and can turn on their videos, probably you can, you can turn on videos and then we can have a photo session arranged by Mas, uh, Demas. Demas. Naomi, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh yeah, pa you. Pa pa Mutakin. Have you have you met before? Pa Mutakin is our head of. The yes, Department. yes, yes. We met, met in, yeah. when yeah, uh, eating a duck. <laughs> oh okay. okay. Oh yeah. The duck place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. And Demas, also go you... to Mon Promo at that time. Demas, could you take our? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, sure. Those. Sure, okay. sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there would be two slides that I need to take. So uh, after I count to three, please uh, hold your uh, pose for three seconds. Okay, um, one, two, and three. Uh, could you wait for a moment? One again. Okay, then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you thank so you much for the, for the audience as well, Pak Merjam. Thank you. Pa -pa no, 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 thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hope to see thank you, you so soon much in you. person. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Don't forget Maybe that we, we, we will have another session next week. Our last session before okay. break. Uh, yes. um, I think on Chinese, chi, China's like, foreign policy. So uh, we will send you the detail later. Sure. Thank sure. you. I'll, thank I'll you. definitely um, uh, come, come by. Uh, okay, so great. That yeah, would be yeah. great, Naomi. Thank right. you yeah. so much. Yeah. So, Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Anissa. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.